lecture, I'm going to take you through the Marxist view of the role and function of education in society. Now, as you remember back from our, your study of Marxism at the beginning of year 12, you will remember that Marxism is a conflict theory and that it believes that society, that in, within society, there is conflict between the bourgeoisie, the, the ruling class, and the proletariat, the working class, and that the working class are unaware of their exploitation and um, oppression um, through the false class consciousness and actually believe that society is fair and just and, natural, and naturally the way it should be. So when it comes to education, we're going to break it down into two sections. We're firstly going to look at how the education system maintains and legitimizes social inequality, according to the Marxists. And then we're going to look at how the education system helps to maintain capitalism. What we're also going to do is look at the um, classic study of learning to labor by Paul Willis, which is used to um, evaluate the Marxist view of education. So what do you need to do? So your task is to use this video plus all the additional resources that are available to you to take notes for your folder. There is the notes grid in your ISB to help you structure your notes. It gives you questions and bullet points that you can use as headings um, and to use as a way to answer them so that you can make sure that your notes are fully complete. And then as evidence, I'm looking for you to color code and highlight the notes grid in the ISB to show your confidence levels with each of the different bullet points and elements on that. That way I can use that to see if there's any areas that I need to perhaps revisit when we're back in school, or perhaps I can give feedback on um, in our next live lesson. Right, so let's get started. Then. So first of all, we're going to look at how the education system reproduces social inequality. And our key thinker here is Atuzer, who's a French Marxist. And I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I'm not 100 percent sure here. But Atuzer um, argues that one of the key functions of education is to reproduce social inequality, is to keep social inequality going. And he says that the education system does this in a, in a couple of ways. The first thing he talks about is the actual structure of educate the education system. We're not talking the school buildings or anything like that, but we're talking about how education is structured as a social institution. And he argues that it engineers middle class success and working class failure. And he says this is necessary to maintain um, to reproduce social inequality so that there is an unqualified workforce available to do the manual labor and the um, factory work and the sort of um, jobs that the bourgeoisie don't want to do essentially. So he argues that the education system, which is obviously influenced by the bourgeoisie, influenced by the ruling class because they are the ones with the power, they create a situation where they make sure that the working class come out of it as an unqualified workforce and the middle classes, the, the ruling classes, are able to come out and take on those managerial and ruling class type roles. Um, and, he's, and one of the ways he says he does, that this is done is through the use of the hidden curriculum. So this is the roles and processes within the education system which are not part of the academic curriculum. So we're not talking about your English lessons or your math lessons or things like that. These are the subconscious, if you like, um, rules and norms and socialization that we have in schools that um, we don't necessarily take notice of. But according to the Marxists, the hidden curriculum helps to engineer the mid middle class success and is there to support the middle classes. And he says they do that this is because the middle class, the, the, start again, this is because the norms and values which are perpetuated in schools are middle class and ruling class values and the working class have a different set of values. Okay, that's not to say 
that the working class values are wrong or that they're um, criminal in any way. They're not. They're just different. They have different foci. So if you remember back to, to functionalism, functionalism, one of the criticisms that comes from uh, the Marxists is that the functionalist view assumes a value consensus. So for Atuzer, this assumption of a value consensus is actually a way for the ruling class to ensure that the middle class succeed and the working class fail within education. Okay. He also points out that the fact that society allows the existence of public, some public schools and private schools is a way of reproducing social inequality because private schooling prepares those people that can afford to go for positions of power. And that's not necessarily through um, academic achievement. That can also be more networking and the idea of the old boys network. And it may not be quite as um, male dominated as it sounds, but it's the idea that a wealthy family can send their child to a high cost public or private school, um, which um, coaches them into going into high level universities, Oxbridge, Red Brick universities, that sort of thing, which then leads them into higher paying jobs, which then means that they meet other powerful and healthy, wealthy even, not healthy, wealthy people and influential people, and they intermarry within that um, environment, which then creates a new wealthy family. So it's not just about your education, it's also about the people that you meet, the networking you make. So it's not what you know as much as who you know that allows the social inequality to occur. So for example, um, it means that the working class perhaps don't have the same opportunities to reach those higher levels of, edu of education, the higher levels of employment, because they don't have the right connections to find out the jobs that are coming up or to um, have somebody put in a good word for them, write a reference for them and things like that. So the creation and the existence of these types of schools reproduces social inequality because it means that people um, are separated. It means that the, the, the wealthy are able to remain wealthy and the working class are not able to break into that world, if you like. So for Atuza, one of the key functions of education is to reproduce social inequality, keep the working class working class, keep the ruling class rich and powerful. OK. He also talks about how the um, education system legitimizes social inequality. And what he means by that is it's about making the social inequality seem natural to make it seem like this is how this is a, a naturally occurring situation. It's not a social construction and that you should accept that this is how things should be. So first of all, again, he talks about cultural capital and economic capital. And he says that the cultural capital, which is the kind of almost common sense knowledge or prior knowledge that the working class have before they get into the education system and the economic capital they have gives them an advantage in the education system. So, for example, in terms of cultural capital, the middle classes are more likely to have been exposed to things like Shakespeare or the theatre. They're more likely to have gone abroad on holiday and experienced other cultures and languages in their natural setting. Um, they may have more likely have been to a museum or an art gallery. So although these and these are um, activities they probably would have done with their families. So it's more likely that they would have had a little bit, not much, but a little bit of background knowledge of the topics that they could be uh, um, covering within their education. And that little bit of background knowledge 
just gives them the edge. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're massively ahead of their working class counterparts, it just gives them a bit of an edge. So when um, their teacher is using certain language or using terminology, they already know what it means. OK, and in terms of the economic capital, the um, middle classes and the, what the ruling classes are more likely to be able to pay for additional resources. Now, we will talk about um, economic capital and economic disadvantage a little bit later in um, the um, differential educational achievement. We'll do that in more detail there. But it's the idea that the working class are limited in the resources. So although school is free at the point of service, there are hidden costs involved. Things like uniform, resources, um, stationery, books, internet access, which is quite apt at the moment. But these sort of things give the middle classes much more of an advantage in the education system. And because we have a free education system in the UK, and I say free in inverted commas, said it's free at the point of service, it's then made to look like the working class are not doing as well in education um, and that's just the way it is. It, it's, it's not that schooling is um, more favouring the middle classes. The outside view, so not the non-Marxist view, is that education is equitable, it is e equal for everybody, and yet the middle classes are given an advantage, or a hidden, and it's almost a hidden advantage that's not really talked about. So when the middle classes do well and the working classes don't do well, that's just the way it is. That's the natural way of things. That's just the, the that's society. OK, so it's almost making it seem like the social inequality is natural. OK. It's not a social construction. And the Marxists believe that it is a social construction. And again, Atuza uses the hidden curriculum as a way to show, as a way to, that schools legitimise social inequality. And he argues that the education system is built so that you are led to blindly accept capitalist values. Things like materialism, and profit and greed and do well, get a good job, have lots of money. This, these are signs of success, which all feed into that capitalist idea of give me more. OK, um, and the, for Atuza, in terms of social inequality, he says that the um, hidden curriculum is almost kind of brainwashing the working classes into believing this is the way things are. But if you work hard, you can become the ruling class. So it's almost like the um, education system is perpetuating that false class consciousness of work hard, do well, buy stuff, spend money and um, you can become part of the ruling class that, that when in fact that's not actually likely to happen. OK. So this kind of makes sense in a way in that we can see how the messages that we get in school tend to push us um, towards a very middle class type um, sense of success. Um, and how the hidden curriculum is shaped to recreate, to make us think that this is the way that life is and this is all um, naturally occurring. But there are criticisms of this. And the first one comes from Guru. And again, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but the guy that's on the board who says that um, the, the Marxists are putting forward a very deterministic view. They're putting forward this idea that we are passive puppets of the hidden curriculum and that we 
just absorb these messages and accept these messages blindly. And Guru suggests that the fact that we have anti-school subcultures within the education system, so these are groups of students who reject education and these um, ways of achieving status and success within schools, um, show that we are not passive puppets, that students and um, people are not passive puppets to this um, idea of hidden curriculum and um, false class consciousness. And in fact, we do have a choice. And the anti-school subcultures prove that we have a choice, that we can be told these messages and still turn around and go, um, yeah, no, not doing that. OK, um, now these anti-school subcultures may be perceived but as being a very negative um, group to be involved with. They, they can be seen as bad students, if you like, troublesome students. But again, Atuza says that that label that is being attached to these anti-school subcultures is in fact a way, again, of legitimising and reproducing social inequality. Okay, um, and he also argues that Marxists fail to acknowledge that it's not just about class. Okay. There are other factors which ha have an impact on educational achievements, such as gender and ethnicity. And oftentimes it's the combination of these three things that create working class success or um, failure. Okay. The other argument against this idea comes from Moro and Torres, who are postmodernists, and they claim that um, the Marxists fail to acknowledge that the education system actually creates a lot of diversity in their students. It's not re just reproducing inequality or legitimising inequality. It's actually allowing students to create their own identities rather than being constrained by social traditional structures such as social class. And they argue that we are in a postmodern society and therefore students are able to make their own choices about their identity. And they exemplify this through the fact that more students feel comfortable enough to identify as LGBTQ plus or have differing religious um, beliefs. But they argue that the education system allows this to happen because there is diversity within the curriculum. There is in terms of how and what we teach. We, uh, the education system provides a means of um, exposing students to different belief systems, to different um, options within their lives. And they then choose how to live their life. And the traditional social structures of class um, no longer have the same power that they perhaps had in previous decades and centuries. Okay. So the next part of um, the Marxist view of education comes from Bowles and, Bowles and Gintis who argue that the purpose of education, the function of education, is help to, helping to maintain the capitalist system. And the first way that they suggest that that is done is through the correspondence principle. And this is the idea that schools mirror the world of work. There are elements of the education system, there are elements of um, world of work which combine to to show to uh, or um, prepare students to enter the uh, world of work which then promotes capitalism and maintains the capitalist system by people going to work earning money spending money on things that they perhaps made at work because if you remember from your study of marxism it's that cycle of the owners don't actually make anything, the workers do, 
But if the workers want to have the stuff that they make, they've got to buy it. And they've got to buy it at the marked up profit making price. OK, this is what was referred to as alienation, the separation of the worker from the goods that they make. OK, so let's think about this. How does the education system mirror the world of work? And there, there are lots of ways that this is done. For example, the fact that in school you are told to work for your grade, not just for the love of learning. You've got to work hard because you've got to do well in your exams. OK, not quite the system at the moment, but we'll, we'll ignore that. Um, but it is that kind of work hard, get good grades. OK, your satisfaction, your success comes from the grades that you achieve. OK, now in the world of work, you work for money, you work for your wages, not necessarily for satisfaction. That doesn't mean there aren't people who enjoy their jobs. There are. I mean, I, I personally really enjoy my, my job. Um, I prefer to be in the classroom, but hey, um, I, I enjoy teaching. I get satisfaction from my job. Um, but what the, the purpose of me going to work is to earn money. I need to earn money to have a life. I need to pay my rent. I've got bills to pay. I need to buy things like food and, and things like that. So it's it mirrors that in sort of like you're doing this for something. You're not doing it for your own satisfaction. I'm doing it because um, I, I get my, I feel good for it. Another way is through this idea of control. In school, you have very little control over your day. It's structured. You go to um, generally anyway, you go to a tutor in the morning, then you've got lesson one, lesson two, break, lesson three, lunch, lesson four, lesson five, go home or back to the boarding house. Um, but your day is controlled. You're told when to go, where to go, what to do, how to do it, when you can go to the toilet, when you can eat. All of these things are tightly controlled. Now, in the world of work, that's very similar. You're told when you have to arrive at work. You are told that you have to uh, when you can have your breaks, when you can have your lunch, when you can go home. OK, you're told what you're what to do it might be your job description. There may be some flexibility within your job, but you have a specific role to play. So you have a lack of control over what you do. For example, in teaching. Um, yes, I control my lessons and I, I determine what I'm te what and how I'm teaching in the classroom. But I don't get to choose when I do the reports that get sent home to parents. I don't choose the discipline system. I don't choose the processes within the education system. And when I worked in um, a coffee shop in a, in a bakery, I had to follow certain rules and I had to do things in certain ways. And it may be that to me that didn't make any sense, but that was the way it was. I wasn't in a position to change those things. Um, you've also got things like discipline and consequences in school. You don't do your work, you get a punishment at work in the world of work. You don't do your job, you lose your job. You don't do as you're told, you, lo you can lose your job. There can be sanctions put on you. OK, and there's things like hierarchies in school. We have the hierarchy, students, teachers, heads of department, heads of house, so on and so forth, up to the head, head teacher and the CEO of the mat. In work, you have your immediate supervisor, then you have your supervisor's boss. And then they may have a boss and then so on and so forth up to the owner of the company. And it may well be that the owner of the company does very little in terms of the day to day running of the company. I can't imagine Jeff Bezos being on the factory floor of Amazon packing boxes or dealing with online things like that. It's very likely that he doesn't do those sort of things. But you can see how that what we do in school prepares you to enter into the world of work and therefore maintain capitalism by going into the capitalist system. The second thing that Bowles and Gintis point out is the myth of meritocracy. Now, if you remember back in functionalism, they argue that the um, education system is meritocratic, that if you work hard, you will do well and that you will achieve what you are meant to achieve. Now, the Marxists say that that's a myth, that in some sense, in some regards, 
yeah, okay, yes, certain people will work hard and do well, but um, because, and this links back to what Atusa was saying, because schools favour the middle classes in terms of language and in terms of cultural capital, in terms of the whole structure of education, it's not meritocratic because the middle classes come in with an advantage. They come in with an edge. OK, so the education system might perpetuate this belief. If you work hard, you can do whatever you want to do. Well, the reality is that's not actually true because there are limits to what you can do ba according to the Marxists based on your class. OK, you uh, and this is where we link into that idea of false class consciousness, where we're told work hard, do well, you can achieve and you can be successful. But then limiting that in terms of, for example, you might be limited as a working class student, you might be limited on which universities you can attend because of fees or because you need to live at, live at home. So you have to go to the local university rather than perhaps one of the more prestigious ones further away. There are the hidden costs of university education, such as paying for your um, accommodation and things like that. So, yeah, you're told in school, aim for university. Success comes from going to university, get a degree, get a good job. But the type of university you can go to or the, the location of the universities you can go to are often limited by things linked back to your class, such as economic sit um, situations. So again, we can see the logic and we can see how this actually does seem to reflect the situation in terms of how education helps to maintain um, capitalism. But there are criticisms of this. And the first one comes from Chubb and Mo, who are new right um, thinkers. And Chubb and Mo argue that the Marxists only see how the education system has failed the working class. And to them, they believe that the education system has in fact failed everyone and that it's not creating um, people who are able to compete in a global um, mar um, job market and that um, children should be prepared to work in a global environment not just in a national one and they believe that the marxists are being limited in the fact that they are focusing purely on the working class being failed okay the second criticism comes from Bowles, uh, comes from Halsey, Floud and Martin who come from a democrat social democratic background and they suggest that the marxists have exaggerated the effect that education has on um, working class under underachievement. And in fact, that the, there are lots of policies and processes in place to in fact help create a more equitable um, education system. Things like comprehensivization, which got rid of the 11 plus and grammar schools and, and sec secondary moderns, meaning that all children, regardless of their background, if attending state education, had the same sort of school. They, you've also got things like pupil premium and um, additional funding for disadvantaged students. Um, quite recently, obviously, with the lockdown and the pandemic and everything, the allocation of laptops and routers and broadband to disadvantaged students. Now, we're not going to go into the discussion about how successful that's been. That's a different di discussion for a different day. But the, it's about the education system adapting and changing to try and create a far more equitable um, and equal education system. And Halsey, Flad and Martin suggest that the Marxists are perhaps being a little bit unfair and exaggerate the um, the amount of um, negative influence the education system has on working class underachievement. 
so let's have a look at um, Willis's study on called learning to labor now there is a tutor to you video on this which is hyperlinked to your remote learning plan and to your ISB which will give you a little bit more detail on this but we can um, Willis um, wanted to find out how passive students actually are in regards to the hidden curriculum and whether or not they do have agency now if you remember the term agency means the ability to make decisions for yourself so Willis wanted to know whether or not particularly working class boys were passively accepting the messages from the hidden curriculum or whether they're actually making a deliberate choice so what he did is he did an ethnographic study which involved interviews and observations with 12 working class lads as he called them from the midlands so he did um non-participant observation um he talked to the boys he um, observed them in school he asked them questions it was an overt observation okay so the boys knew that they were taking part in this study and it's ethnographic because he was looking at working class boys okay so he did this study and you can if you want to go into detail but um, when you look at the video we'll go into details about some of the more ethical um, how do we put this ethical issues that arise from this study and some of the things that Willis did that perhaps nowadays we would be kind of like um, no that would be a safeguarding issue um but that's for another time but what he found that was that um in actual fact in terms of hidden curriculum and in terms of the function of the education system as an agency of socialization it's actually not very good at that it's not school and education is not very good at passing on norms and values of society and creating that value consensus and in actual fact students and young people make an active decision to about their future and in this case the 12 working class lads had made an active decision that they wanted to go into manual labor they wanted to follow their family traits their family traditions okay so it's showing that the family had far more influence over educational achievement and educational expectations than the system itself so these boys whose parents or fathers in particular at this point were working in mines and they were working in factories and builders and manual labor such as that the boys were very much a case of oh no when i finish school i'm going to go and work with my dad i'm going to go on the building site i'm going to go down the mine i'm going to so it was almost like the family had had much more influence over the um, decisions that the boys made in terms of their future and for Willis this proved that students had agency that students were able to make active decisions about their future and about how they lived their lives rather than being dictated to by the education system so we can conclude as a criticism of the Marxist view that the Marxist views are overly deterministic that they are suggesting that passivity that Willis has proven isn't actually there now as I said Willis's study has a number of um, criticisms to it for one he's looking at 12 students 12 working class boys from the Midlands who were all in the same school so we, this study doesn't really have generalizability um, it's also quite old it was the 1970s and society has moved on since then um, and a lot of the industries that these lads would have been wanting to go into perhaps no longer exist or have um, a more limited um, availability than they had back then um, there's also some of the uh, as I said about the ethics of some of the things that he did like um, taking the boys back to his flat and providing them with cigarettes and things like that that today we would be kind of like um no 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 you don't do things like that uh, <laughs> but it, we can use this study as application to show that determinism so when you're writing your essays about marxism 
or your exam style questions about Marxism. This is a really nice study to use as a way of proving that determinism. OK, so. So just to reiterate then, so we've gone through how the education system maintains and legitimizes social inequality. We've explained how it maintains capitalism and we've used the Paul Willis study to evaluate the Marxist view of education. So your task is once you've taken your notes for your folders and again, how you do that is completely up to you. Color code and highlight the notes grid in your ISB according to your levels of confidence with this with this topic on the different sections. And when you've done that, click submit on the assignment so that I can go and have a look so I can see any patterns across the class about anything that I need to go into more detail. But don't forget, there are other resources as well. There are other videos out there that may explain things slightly differently. Um, it's all the same knowledge, but as you know, people explain things differently. You've got the website, you've got the textbooks, you've got lots of resources to um, have a look at to supplement this lecture.